Um, thanks for having me. Uh, welcome back. Uh, and um, so the, the title of my talk uh, this afternoon is uh, Soft Tissue Sarcoma Surgery. Um, that word sarcoma, as Charles knows, uh, we, we forgot to add that, but uh, anyways, it's, it's sarcoma. So soft tissue sarcoma surgery. And uh, I always consider this a, a privilege and a, a pleasure to talk about this topic because I consider myself a, a dedicated uh, sarcoma well, a, a surgical oncologist dedicated to uh, sarcoma. Um, and of course I'm at uh, USC. Um, so just a little bit of uh, background um, very briefly about myself. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, I came from Northwestern and UCSF and then uh, spent time at MD Anderson before coming to USC uh, at Southern California here in Los Angeles uh, in 2014. Um, I uh, also wanted to say that uh, I, um, uh, I have, uh, uh, you know, I've been supportive. That's my wife there, and then uh, also have a uh, a four year old, um, as well as a a, a uh, we we call him a small anxious dog. Um, he's a a twelve pound uh, Jack Russell Terrier mix. Um, I also uh, uh, am active in um, <clears throat> with uh, social media pages. Uh, these are uh, meant. Feel free to visit them um, to follow me. Uh, these are meant to be more educational, but kind of uh, also gives you a perspective on uh, what I do every day. Um, so my disclosures, uh, I do have uh, financial disclosures with up to date. Uh, it's a online resource for physicians where I write um, the chapter every year on um, uh, retroperitoneal sarcoma. And then as might have been mentioned uh, previously, I'm, I've been uh, on the medical advisory board for Sarcoma Alliance, and uh, as of the last year, uh, Board of Directors as well. Um, disclosures about this talk is that uh, this will be focused exclusively on, uh, on soft tissue sarcoma, and uh, I will, will not be discussing uh, bone sarcoma. In fact, I believe Dr. Zuckerman, the talk to follow, uh, this one will uh, talk about that. Um, and then uh, the other disclosure that I have about this talk is, well, this is uh, uh, focused on surgery and that uh, most of it will be uh, things or a lot of it will be things that, that the, the audience may already know about. Um, I hope that you'll uh, pick up on the nuances, the subtleties of it and uh, uh, derive, uh, learn something new about soft tissue sarcoma surgery. Um, the other disclosure uh, is that I will be showing pictures from surgery and some of those um, in, uh, you may find um, uh, a, a little bit more on the, the graphic side, although I was selective about uh, picking the pictures to show. Okay, so getting to the talk itself, uh, just a general outline. <clears throat> we will uh, spend uh, very briefly just on soft tissue sarcoma, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, then we'll talk about uh, soft tissue sarcoma surgery uh, with respect to uh, extremity and trunk and then retroperitoneal, um, and then uh, very briefly about uh, palliative surgery as well. Um, and then I'll end with some uh, slides about other, other considerations in soft tissue sarcoma surgery. Um, so just briefly, uh, soft tissue sarcoma, as everybody knows at this point, is rare. Uh, it's 1% of all cancers in, in adults. Uh, it can also develop anywhere in the body. And I think that's an important point to understand. Um, and uh, the most common location would be the extremities or the, the arms and the legs, uh, more commonly the, the legs, the ex uh, lower extremity as opposed to the upper extremity. Uh, about 20% of sarcoma is also developed in the retroperitoneum. Um, you'll hear that term over and over, over again in this talk and throughout the meeting. And that uh, basically refers to the back of the abdomen. It's about 20% of sarcomas. Um, the other very important thing to know about soft tissue sarcoma is that there are many, many different subtypes. So within that umbrella of 1% of all cancers, <clears throat> there's about 50 to 70, maybe up to 100 different subtypes. Um, and in 2016, I came up with this, this analogy that, I, that um, you know, my, my patients uh, know that I use uh, uh, quite often, and that's that soft tissue sarcoma is a little bit like wine in the sense that there are many, many different um, uh, uh, subtypes and there's many different nuances of wine, many different varieties of wine. Um, so for somebody who is uh, not um, a wine connoisseur, and ironically, I'm not a wine connoisseur myself, uh, 
I wouldn't really know all the details between the different kinds of wine. And similarly, for somebody who is not a specialist in sarcoma, they might not know all the important nuances between one subtype versus another subtype. Um, what's key in terms of the treatment of soft tissue sarcoma, even though this talk is focused on surgery, um, surgery is an important part, but what is key is that the treatment is a team effort. It's a multidisciplinary team effort, and the treatment uh, can often involve not just surgery, but chemotherapy or systemic therapy. Uh, I also call it uh, drug therapy sometimes um, and uh, radiation therapy. So it really is a collaboration between all the different specialties um, which are most of them are represented here at this, this meeting today uh, and tomorrow. Um, but I also want to emphasize that it includes uh, radiology and pathology. Uh, so at um, most sarcoma centers or maybe even all sarcoma centers, the, the radiologists and the pathologists are also uh, specialized in sarcoma. The treatment is, a, is very much a team effort. Um, it's also a very personalized treatment. So uh, some of the uh, so the slides that I'm about to show and some of the, the slides that you know, the talks that you hear at this meeting uh, are very generalized. But when it comes down to that that individual patient in front of you, the treatment may be very different from a, a patient with a similar subtype with a similar situation. It's very personalized. So getting back to surgery uh, for soft tissue sarcoma, uh, this is the, the main form of treatment for localized disease. And what I mean by that is that it has not spread or metastasized. Uh, but what's important to recognize for uh, surgery in, in sarcoma is that it's, it's very much uh, a balance between the surgical technique uh, and having good surgical technique, as well as the biology of the disease. And when I say biology of the disease, that really means an understanding of the, the behavior of the, the, the tumor. Um, a lot of that has to do with the, the subtype, going back to that wine analogy that I presented a few slides ago, uh, but really understanding the disease itself independent of uh, what happens at surgery, independent of the, 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 uh, the, the uh, technique of uh, surgery. Um, and as you can see uh, with these um, composite pictures, um, <clears throat> just, because of the fact that sarcoma can develop um, anywhere in the body, uh, extremities, uh, trunk, abdomen, or retroperitoneum. Uh, as a sarcoma surgeon, I operate um, at, at all those body locations. Um, and so it, it is really uh, different, I'd say, compared to breast cancer or colon cancer, where surgeons who treat those cancers would uh, primarily or exclusively focus on, say, the breast or the colon. Um, for a, a, a sarcoma surgeon to uh, really consider him or herself a sarcoma surgeon, they need to be comfortable operating in uh, different parts of the body. Uh, emphasize again that uh, balance between technique and biology. Um, so when we think about uh, surgery for soft tissue sarcoma, uh, one way to think about it is uh, extremity and trunk versus retroperitoneal. Um, and I'll, I'll show slides uh, uh, talking about surgery for uh, those specific body locations. Um, what I also wanted to emphasize today with this talk is that it is important to have a good understanding of what the intent of surgery is. Um, and that's in, in most cases, that's curative. Uh, that's what we are aiming for. Um, and uh, um, so that's, that's the majority of cases. However, there is also a palliative surgery. And as I mentioned, I will have a few slides about this. Um, I did want to say up front, just to define this, when I say palliative surgery, that means that the patient has a, a symptom. And so the intent of surgery when it's palliative is to address uh, or specifically to relieve that symptom. Um, and what's important with this with the, uh, the intent of surgery uh, is patient understanding. So with extremity and trunk, um, let me start off with a uh, brief example, um, a, a specific patient. Uh, this patient is a 24 year old female. Uh, she is a writer uh, and she <clears throat> presented with a right axillary and chest wall rhabdomyosarcoma. This is her MRI. Uh, gives you a sense of the, the tumor itself. And um, uh, you could see that uh, it, it is close to that uh, bright line at the very bottom underneath it is a, a major blood vessel. 
Uh, this area is also not shown in this picture, but this area also has important nerves, the brachial plexus. Uh, so it's a very challenging location um, in, a, in a young female uh, patient. Um, the patient went to see an uh, orthopedic surgeon at a, a community hospital, and uh, they recommended amputation. Um, and keep in mind, when we say amputation in this particular case, this particular location, this would be the entire arm. Uh, entire arm and, in fact, probably uh, the shoulder as well. Uh, so major operation. Um, and this is also in the context, keep in mind that this particular patient had, uh, at the time of these recommendations, this presentation of disease, uh, she actually had normal arm function. Uh, her right arm and hand were fine, um, and she had uh, no uh, swelling. Uh, the swelling is, um, would be suggestive of vascular invasion, venous invasion. Um, so when we saw the patient in clinic, uh, we offered, we uh, referred the patient to medical oncology um, and we started uh, systemic therapy, um, chemotherapy. Uh, this is neoadjuvant. That's, that's the, the medical term for surgery, uh, uh, drug therapy, systemic therapy before surgery. Um, the uh, tumor did not actually shrink or change and uh, didn't, it pretty much stayed, stayed the same. Um, but uh, we uh, went forward with surgery with the intention to save her limb, not to do amputation. Um, and you could see uh, that those are actually uh, neuromonitoring leads to uh, I'd be able to identify the nerves at the time of surgery and protect and save them. Um, so we were able to uh, do this to achieve complete resection, uh, save her, her limb, uh, her arm. Um, now, I wanted to point out that this was a much longer, complicated operation. This was probably an eight, eight to 10 hour operation to dissect off all the, the blood vessels and nerves and to preserve them, whereas an amputation would probably take one or two hours. Um, so much more complicated operation, but of course, well worth it. Um, and then the patient went on to receive systemic therapy and uh, radiation therapy in the adjuvant setting. So that means after surgery. Um, so for extremity uh, soft tissue sarcoma surgery, amputations, this one is showing lower extremity. Um, it's, uh, amputations are, are more uh, of a historical thing. Um, currently, uh, uh, or for the last 10, maybe even 20 years, limb salvage, uh, I would argue, is the, the standard of care for extremity soft tissue sarcoma. Um, the, what limb salvage really means is that you have to, to do an optimal cancer operation. Um, and then oftentimes, uh, part of limb salvage includes radiation therapy to improve local control. And there we have uh, a good uh, data, um, good studies that show that this, this approach to extremity soft tissue sarcoma gives you equivalent survival to doing an amputation. Um, the, uh, the whole goal of all this, of course, is to, to preserve function. Um, and then one question that often comes up when you do limb salvage uh, is, uh, what about the margins? Um, do you need negative margins? Um, and I should back up a second to say that what margins refers to is uh, normal tissue around the tumor that um, you, you always want to uh, ideally try to strive uh, for negative margins. Um, and so, yes, you do, do want to get negative margins. The, the distance, the, you need to get one centimeter of normal tissue or two centimeters or even five centimeters. Um, it really depends on the, the subtype. Um, and that gets back to that wine analogy that I presented at the very beginning. Um, it also depends on uh, tissue barriers, uh, fascia, which is a, a thick um, lining on top of the muscle. Um, if you have that, that's on the, let's say, the, the back of the tumor, um, that is, even though it may be very thin, that fascia actually provides a good uh, margin. Um, and you don't have to get a very wide margin as long as you have fascia. Um, it also depends on the extent of your margins. The distance of the margins depends on the adjacent critical structures. So there's vessels and nerves, um, even though they might be right up against the tumor, just like in the case that I showed, uh, there's a lot of uh, push or consideration, if possible, to try to save those at the expense of uh, not getting wide margins. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's, uh, those are, that's uh, for extremity uh, soft tissue sarcoma. Now I wanted to focus on retroperitoneal. 
Um, again, this means the back of the abdomen. Um, and you could think of this as the kidneys, and also those are the major blood vessels right there. That's the vena cava and the aorta in that diagram. Um, so retroperitoneal back of the abdomen. Um, so this is a, a different situation, uh, I, I would say. Uh, and then uh, this description that I have here um, kind of gives you an idea of what we're dealing with. Um, it, so uh, a wide midline incision was made uh, basically going from the bottom of the chest to the uh, bottom of the abdomen. A uh, retractor was put into place exposing the retroperitoneal sarcoma and the medical student, um, in this case, we're at a teaching hospital, a uh, medical student looked at it and said, wow, that is a big tumor. And this is what that looks like. Um, a very large tumor, uh, basically occupying, in this case, occupying the majority of the abdomen. Um, it's uh, may be a little subtle, but that's um, a colon there. Uh, and uh, behind it are also uh, a lot of other important organs and structures. So with that previous discussion that we had about margins, I would kind of challenge you or ask you to, to think about what kind of margins you would try to get with this because, and I say that kind of half jokingly because you can't really, it touches upon everything. So you, unless you plan to take out everything, uh, the margins are uh, negative margins, wide negative margins are difficult to achieve. Um, they're, they're actually difficult to assess for the pathologist just because it's such a large tumor. So retroperitoneal sarcoma in the United States, uh, standard resection is complete tumor removal. Uh, and, and then adjacent organs and structures like the colon or the kidney or uh, major blood vessels, uh, we do have to remove them uh, if, they're, if they are involved. Um, I won't get into too much detail, but those, those flags there, Italy and France, are trying to, uh, to just to, to emphasize briefly that um, uh, this standard of resection is uh, a little bit controversial and there's a different um, approach to this disease and uh, the surgical management of this disease in Europe. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we all do agree that uh, retroperitoneal sarcoma surgery should be open, should not be laparoscopic. Um, and then uh, in about 50% of patients, pretty much half of patients, uh, retroperitoneal sarcoma surgery involves removing one kidney and uh, part of the colon, usually the left or the right side, uh, depending on where the tumor is located. Um, but these operations can be much, much more, as you can imagine. Um, and then oftentimes uh, we find ourselves with a multidisciplinary surgical team. And I always find that interesting that we have multidisciplinary uh, sarcoma team in terms of medical oncology, radiation oncology. Uh, but when we, we do these, uh, these operations for retroperitoneal sarcoma, we often have vascular surgery or palatobiliary surgery. Uh, anesthesia is very important, as well as ICU care after surgery. Um, so uh, this is a, a very, uh, I'd say, a different um, sarcoma in the sense that it's a very, uh, there are big tumors. Uh, but not only that, uh, and, and similar to other sarcomas in other parts of the body, um, as, I, as I've said in the previous slides, um, it involves more than just getting it out. Um, it involves an understanding of the disease, uh, even though they're big operations and the, the surgical technique is very important. What we're finding as a field is that the biology of the disease uh, and specifically the subtype, for example, liposarcoma versus liomasarcoma, the behavior is very different and that, that definitely does impact how we manage the, the, uh, the disease. Um, so I, I wanted to, so that we talked about extremity uh, and uh, retroperitoneal sarcoma surgery. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about uh, palliative surgery in soft tissue sarcoma. Um, and this can apply to any body location. Um, and um, I did want to say that uh, uh, oftentimes this, this uh, we, we talk about palliative surgery in the setting of recurrent disease. That means when the tumor comes back, not when it first shows up. Um, we sometimes also talk about palliative surgery in the setting of metastatic disease. So that means when a patient has, um, let's say, lung metastases, as well as a, uh, an, an intact primary tumor in the thigh, for example, uh, we can consider doing um, palliative surgery for, the, the, uh, for one or some of those tumors and not all of the, the tumors in the body, in that, in that patient's body. 
Um, but again, I want to emphasize that, that this is palliative surgery means that you, you have to have a symptom and where the, the intent of surgery, the goal of surgery is to try to address that symptom. Um, I also wanted to emphasize that uh, uh, palliative surgery is not hospice. So we're not talking about end of life care here. Um, so this is one example of palliative surgery and specifically this is in the abdomen. Um, this is a tumor developing. Um, in that picture on the right there, I tried to minimize it just so that doesn't, it isn't too, too graphic. Um, but tumor debulking basically means taking out uh, part of the tumor, tumor in pieces. Uh, the pieces part, sometimes we refer to that as piecemeal resection. Um, so what's important going in or considering a patient uh, for uh, tumor debulking or piecemeal resection is, of course, the goal. Um, understanding specifically what are you trying to achieve not just getting rid of as much tumor as possible, but going back to the symptoms, what uh, symptom are you specifically trying to, to uh, relieve? Uh, oftentimes that can be pain. Um, the, the tumor that you're trying to debulk is causing pain, uh, but you really have to ask yourself, uh, both on my side as a surgeon, as well as on the patient side, once we do that operation, are we really gonna get rid of that pain? Um, and then what's very important, I'd say, is the safety of the operation. Um, I, I have to say that I, I think a lot of patients that I see who come to me um, for this discussion about tumor debulking or, or piecemeal resection um, might be, if I may say it a little bit on the, the, the desperate side, and then they, they may kind of just, you, you may just think of the patient, oh, just get out as much tumor as possible. Um, well, it's, it's often not that simple, unfortunately. Um, and some of these considerations are listed here. Uh, but I, and I won't go through all the details, but I just wanted to point out that these operations can be associated with major blood loss. Um, this can be uncontrolled blood loss because when you disrupt the integrity of the tumor, it's, it's often very hard to get good control of the bleeding that happens when, when you do that. Um, organ injury, uh, fistula. Uh, so fistula means a, a, a connection uh, or a, a leakage from an organ. So in the pelvis, that could be rectum. In the abdomen, that could be any uh, small intestines. Uh, and that actually leads to a different set of problems and a different set of uh, symptoms that um, arguably is uh, worse quality of life if you do have one of those complications. Um, and I think that the ultimate question with tumor debulking, because uh, these can be major operations with uh, a lot of uh, potential for complications, is how durable uh, is um, your symptom relief with this palliative operation? Um, I, I'd say that I, I think as a field, and even in my own personal experience, we don't have a good answer for that. It's very uh, individualized, very personalized. So, um, is there more? Uh, and the, the answer is yes. Uh, are there other considerations? Um, so uh, one of the, the major considerations when looking at surgery for soft tissue sarcoma is quality of life. Uh, we kind of went into this a little bit with the previous slides about, um, about uh, a palliative surgery. Um, and I uh, just wanted to go through quality of life uh, with extremity and then again with retroperitoneal sarcoma very briefly. Um, so when we talk about limb salvage, uh, again, that often involves radiation. And um, with, uh, there's two ways of delivering that radiation. You can either give it before surgery, that's neoadjuvant, or you can give it after surgery, that's uh, adjuvant. And those are associated with uh, different outcomes in terms of complications and quality of life. Um, and you can see that if you give radiation post-op uh, after surgery, adjuvant setting, um, the fibrosis that patients get from this is actually associated with lower quality of life. Um, and I'll just, uh, the point of this is that there's a, a study in Germany that I think is interesting, from Germany that I think is interesting because it shows that uh, depending on what aspect of quality of life you're looking at, whether you do surgery alone or radiation and then surgery or surgery and radiation, it, it very much differs in terms of uh, quality of life parameters. Um, and then despite what we said all about limb salvage, I, I wanted to show uh, this particular patient of mine uh, who we ended up doing a major amputation. Uh, of course, very personalized decision um, and uh, uh, you know, very different from um, the case that I showed earlier. 
And I, I still I still remember that this patient told me that sometimes amputation is better. Um, it is actually simpler to do. Patients do recover faster from that in certain cases. Uh, so again, just emphasizing how uh, very, it's a very personalized, individualized decision. Um, so retroperitoneal sarcoma surgery, quality of life, of course, is very important as well. Um, unfortunately, as a field, we really have not studied this uh, that well yet. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the areas that um, you know myself and colleagues are really uh, trying to formally look at. Um, and one example is um, the type of resection. Uh, so as I mentioned in the United States, there's standard resection. In um, Europe, there's what's called extended resection. And without it getting into all the details, uh, the recovery from extended resection is longer. Um, however, over the course of, say, a 10-year period, getting a patient to no evidence of disease for standard resection may require three operations, whereas for extended resection, bigger operation, it may only require two. Um, one of the big questions about this is, what is better quality of life with this? Is it, you know, do you have better quality of life with a uh, a, a quote, smaller operation in the beginning versus a bigger operation, um, knowing that you may have multiple operations in your lifetime. Um, it's something that we're trying to formally study as a field. And then I, I also wanted to emphasize uh, or bring up that um, uh, in retroperitoneal sarcoma surgery, especially for liposarcoma, uh, there is something called scanxiety, or this is what uh, patients will, what uh, patients experience. And that's the, 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 um, the anxiety that comes uh, before getting the CT scan, uh, knowing that uh, th these are big operations. However, even after a big operation, there, there is uh, unfortunately a high rate of recurrence. Um, and that, that, of course, affects quality of life. Um, so lastly, getting to the end of my talk, uh, other considerations, uh, patient understanding is very important. Um, and I would say that as the patient, um, to uh, improve your own understanding of uh, the, the surgery you're about to undergo, be prepared, ask questions. Sometimes the questions require a second visit. Uh, oftentimes, uh, my patients, I, I in fact do schedule a second follow-up visit just to go over the operation again to see if there are any, any other questions. Um, as part of this understanding, um, I think it is very important to see a sarcoma specialist. This is uh, something that, that um, uh, a topic that I feel very passionate about that you could see is emphasized uh, in many of the other talks uh, here at this meeting. Um, and uh, just briefly, uh, are outcomes better with the sarcoma specialist? The answer is probably intuitive, uh, yes. And this is the literature, uh, the data that suggests, that supports that. The largest study is uh, from uh, France uh, with 36,000 patients that shows uh, better survival when patients are seen <clears throat> within a, a sarcoma center uh, as opposed to outside. Um, this also leads to the question, what defines a sarcoma specialist? Um, some of this is my own two cents, um, but I would say the experience of uh, the, the specialist um, and the volume of patients, sarcoma patients, of course, specifically, uh, as well as contribution to the field. Um, I. Uh, along with my colleagues in um, Italy and in France, we, we put together this editorial uh, that actually defines, and you can see the sommelier part of it, it goes off of that wine analogy, uh, but we actually try to define a sarcoma specialist in terms of uh, a surgeon, sar sarcoma surgeon. Um, and these are all the things that, um, that uh, we, we kind of emphasized, uh, again, experience, um, having uh, dedicated fellowship training, dedication to sarcoma, uh, as well as case volume, as well as participation in the field and contribution in the field in terms of research and publications. And then emphasizing again, the, uh, the importance of multidisciplinary discussion or the ability of that sarcoma specialist to, uh, to discuss uh, or to be part of multidisciplinary discussion. Um, finally, uh, other considerations, as we said, as the patient, be prepared, ask questions. And then I, um, I uh, really want uh, everybody to stay strong, to stay positive, uh, to maintain hope. And um, I uh, wrote about this specifically. I'm a strong believer of giving uh, patients with sarcoma, uh, cancer, of course, but uh, sarcoma specifically, a uh, strong believer of giving patients hope. 
So stay hopeful, stay strong, stay positive. And with that, um, I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Uh, that's my contact information, my email. Uh, all of my patients have uh, my email, uh, you know, uh, access to that and happy to, to answer questions uh, offline as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. And we'll put that contact information in the chat as well, so. Yeah, great. So we do have time for a few questions. Um, yeah. Looks like there's a few down there, so. So what about using ablation instead of complete resection? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, I don't I don't have a good good answer for that, and uh, I, I think as a field we don't we don't have that many that much experience with ablation, whether it's cryoablation, freezing the tumor, or radiofrequency ablation, burning the tumor. Um, I I'd say that uh, from a surgery standpoint, some of the considerations would be what surgery would look like after you do that, uh, because it can cause some local inflammation, scar tissue to form, potentially making surgery harder to do. So it could be a consideration uh, if, if surgery is, if, you know, if surgery is impossible or the surgeon says that, that surgery is not an option. Okay. Um, and uh, you mentioned different subtypes have been taken into consideration during surgery. Why is this? What difference can the subtype make to surgical decisions? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So just even uh, margins, um, that's again, that, that normal healthy tissue that you want to get around the tumor. So the, 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 uh, the distance that you get, the amount of margins varies depending on the subtype. Um, so for desmoid tumor, um, Desmoid tumor, you really don't even have to get margins at all. You just have to get the tumor out. Whereas if you had uh, the exact same location of the body, uh, just a different subtype, like a myxofibrosarcoma, you would try to get wider margins. Um, and that just that goes back to the behavior of the tumor. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's one example. That subtype makes a big difference. And... Um... Does grade and size of the tumor correlate with clinical outcome? Grade and size, yes. Yes, they do, for sure. How prevalent are skin flaps and grafts to repair feet after sarcoma tumor has been removed? Repair feet, you said? What, yeah. what was it? Yes. How prevalent are skin flaps and grafts to repair feet after, maybe after a sarcoma tumor has been removed, maybe, um, I'm the, not sure about. Gina, did, did you say feet? I'm, I'm trying to find the question. It feet. says feet. Maybe mm -hmm. we can have Kirk re ask that. Oh, repair feet after. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I, we I'm can sure read. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, but skin flaps and grafts, it, it, it's often a plastic surgeon that makes that decision, at least in my practice. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll clarify that question and I can answer it offline. Okay. And this is just a nice comment. Thank you, Dr. Singh. I have a, a retroperitoneal lyomyel sarcoma, 20 years. It's been quite a case. My little body, been stage four since 2004. Quality of life is huge. Thank you. It's day by day, every day. So that's yeah. a whole comment there. And then um, is radiation useful or, well, uh, safe in a patient with Lee Fermani syndrome? Should we avoid it? And I think we're going to have a, a radiation oncologist speak. So I think we can wait for that one. Um, and we got time for one more. Okay. Um, I think we're, I think we're caught up with the, oh, hand uh, UPS. Have you ever dealt with anyone? It was a whoops procedure. Patient was advised superficial and deep coming off the extensor tendon of the dorsal side of the hand, ultimately rate amputation per recommendation due to better function than radiation. Is limb salvage in a hand usually an option? This was a 14-year-old boy. Yeah, it's, um, 
It's, it's always an option. Um, however, it's a very individualized, personalized decision. And it's, it's hard to say just with a question like this without you know, actually seeing the patient, seeing what the hand function is with the tumor in place, and then how feasible it is to save important nerves, vessels, tendons. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a straightforward answer, but it's, it's definitely an option. It's always something we strive for, but, um, but sometimes we can't. Um, and sometimes amputation is the best oper operation to do from the cancer standpoint, as well as from a functional standpoint, even though you won't have a hand afterwards, of course. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Singh. Yeah. We appreciate your time.